Hi, this is Len Epp from LeanPub, and in this episode of the Back Matter Podcast, I'll be talking with Nathan Bransford. Based in New York, Nathan is a freelance editor and media strategy consultant who has helped companies from Uber to CNET build online communities and advise them on strategic online program management. He is a former literary agent and the author of the Jacob Wonderbar middle grade novels, as well as the book How to Write a Novel. And he is the writer of a, ve- of a very popular blog for writers that you can find online at blog.nathanbransford.com. Listed regularly as one of the best websites for writers by Writer's Digest, Nathan's blog covers all the important dimensions of the book publishing industry and the profession of writing generally. You can follow Nathan on Twitter at Nathan Bransford, and once again, you can find his blog, which I highly recommend, at blog.nathanbransford.com. In this interview, we're going to talk about Nathan's diverse career, uh, writing, his media consulting work, and issues of importance to writers and people in the book publishing industry generally. So thank you, Nathan, for being on the Back Matter podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin stories, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you became interested in writing and publishing generally. Definitely. Um, I grew up in a really small town in Northern California. Uh, if anyone's seen my, my picture for my blog, I kind of look like a s- surfer a little bit, or at least I get confused with the surfer. But the truth is that I grew up in a farming town. My, my dad's a rice farmer. Um, I grew up in a town of 4,000 people, um, and not to date myself too much, but I grew up before the internet. And so growing up in a, in a really small town in, um, in America, I, I was always fascinated by the broader world and the best act, avenue into that was, was through reading. And so from a very young age, I, I read, um, so many, um, so many books and, uh, every, anything I could get my hands on, um, you know, we had a town library and I read my way through that small library. Anytime we went to a big city, <laughs> which, uh, was, was not super often. Um, I would drag my parents to the bookstore and make them, um, buy me as much as they would, they would allow uh, me to buy. And, uh, so yeah, so I just grew up with a, re- a real love of books. And when I got to college, um, I, I became an English major and I, I began to, um, think about what possibly making my, my way, um, in a career with books. And so, um, I, I, I was, as I was I taking creative writing classes and I wasn't getting great positive feedback. I mean, justifiably so I was not a great writer in, in college. And, uh, I took a class with the, the author of Vikram, Vikram Seth, who wrote a suitable boy. And he was really, he was one of the people who's been, who was really supportive of me and during a time when I wasn't getting a lot of positive feedback about my writing. And he, I told him, you know, I think I want to go into, um, into book publishing. I think I want to be an editor. And, uh, and he's, he's like, why would you want to do that? <laughs> um, and he was like, no, 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 just, just go and hole up in your parents' basement and write a novel. Like, and, but I didn't listen to him. And instead, I, I went into to book publishing. I, I was fortunate enough after college to land a job with the president of Curtis Brown Limited, which is a great literary agency. And that kind of set me on my path to, to being a literary agent for eight years. So, I, I yeah, I think those early days being bored in a small town kind of led set me on my path to, to being involved in the world of books. Um, I've got a very specific question. I checked out your, your profile on LinkedIn and I guess, I guess this, I, I will, I'm going to go, go ahead and date you a little bit. Um, but you were, you were at Stanford, uh, studying English during the dot com boom. Uh, and I've actually, I've actually interviewed, um, a number of, of, uh, authors for, for a different podcast, um, who tend to be kind of technical book writers and, I've interviewed people who've studied at Stanford at various stages, you know, early 90s, things like that. Um, and uh, I was wondering, as a former English major myself, what was what was it like being an English major at Stanford when everybody's got presumably had their eyes on on all this money happening in the tech world? <laughs> yeah. No, it's a great question. I mean, it was a really fascinating time to be um, be yeah at Stanford during that time. I mean, I had classmates who were dropping out to join these these harebrained dot coms. Um, I would you know be going to football games and talking to alumni in the um, in the parking lot, and and they would be offering me jobs and be disappointed to find out I was an English major. Um, it was a really it was a really interesting time. Um, I even I even took a, a, a computer science class during that time. And I had a TA named Marissa, and it wasn't on, until a couple years ago that I realized that that TA Marissa was Marissa Mayer, <laughs> who ended up being the CEO of Yahoo. I, I sort of was reading a profile of her, 
and it mentioned that she spent some time teaching at Stanford. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. I was, that Marissa, who was my TA, was Marissa Mayer. And, uh, and it turns out it totally was. So, yeah, it was a really fascinating time to be there. And because I was – there was so much sort of pressure all around me to kind of go into tech and, and to kind of join the, the new wave. And in some ways it kind of hardened um, my resolve to go um, in, in an opposite path and to really pursue it, something that was – a real passion of, of my uh, books, which in the face of the world definitely changing. At the same time, I really have always had a, a true and genuine fascination with technology and innovation. Um, and so I've, I've, I feel like in my career, I've really paired those two things. And a lot of my, um, my, my life has been driven by a love of technology and a love of books and storytelling yeah i'm looking forward to asking you some questions about your uh your work in the more recent years um about tech and uh, with with companies like uber and things like that and building online platforms um but before we do that uh so you you graduated from university and it, it seems relatively soon after that you got what i think a lot of english majors would consider to be perhaps before going into it a dream job uh with a you know big name uh agency uh what was it like when you started out as a literary agent, what did, what were, what were the, some of the things that you had to learn that you didn't know uh, that you had to learn right away? Well, I think one of the things it was, it really was a dream job. And I, I, I just, I look back on it. Um, it was just so incredibly fortunate. I answered a Craigslist, Craigslist ad and, and ended up with one of the top agents in, in, in book publishing. Um, I think when you graduate from college as an English major, you've really learned to think about books in a very particular way, and what you're thinking about books is um, what do they mean? What are what are the cultural threads that the the author is tapping in tapping into? What are the what are the deeper um, threads and things like that? But when you start working in book publishing, you're reading in a very different way uh, that is much more oriented to two main things. Like one, does this work? Like is this was this story well told? Is it well executed? Um, and, and secondly, what's its commercial viability? Can, can you sell it? Um, and shifting that mindset, uh, at the, at the time I, I took that job, I didn't realize I was going to be a writer. I, I still was not really thinking I had the talent or that I was a creative person or, um, I kind of, uh, overly internalized some of the, the, the feedback I received in college. Um, and so, but I really, in, in retrospect, it was an enormously helpful shift in mindset that ended up helping me very, very much when I, when I began to write in my late twenties. Yeah. One of the questions I had to ask you about that, because, you know, you've had this experience both as a, as an agent and as, as a, and at, at one time an aspiring author now, now an author with, you know, a trilogy behind you and, and a nonfiction book and another novel that you're working on, which I'd like to ask you about in a bit, but, uh, as I understand it, one of the really interesting things that, I mean, probably most listeners to this podcast would be aware of is things from the side of the author where you sort of feel like you don't know what it's like on the other side of the, how do you get your foot in the door basically is the biggest concern that people often have, particularly when they're starting out. Uh, but the, the pressures from the agent side are actually trying to get the right people through that door. And, yeah, and you're competing with other agents to do that. So it's it's kind of like a, I, I imagined a sort of similar set of feelings, but just from a very different perspective. Yeah, that's very astute. And it's very true. I mean, as a young um, as a young agent, especially uh, particularly before you have a strong um, track record behind you, it's a real scrap. I mean, you, you really have to convince. So, I mean, you're always on the lookout for something you can sell, but even when you find something that that's that's promising, you're in competition with all of these other agents with very strong track records. And so uh, it's, it's you're looking for these diamonds in the rough that you can polish or uh, to build a personal connection with an author for the long term um, and, and jumping in as fast as possible on the projects that could potentially work and then trying to, to – to, sell the author on yourself without a track record. And it's, it's a real challenge. Um, so it, it, you know, it's not, and it's not getting easier. It's a, it's a really challenging industry to build a career in because it's not the, the traditional side of the business is not growing at a rapid rate. 
And uh, be, because of technology, a lot of the established agents can take on more work and more business and, and are, are able to be more efficient in how they, they represent their clients. So w- one of the r- ways that I adapted to that environment was by starting my, my blog. And I orig- at the time, I, I thought that I needed a way to differentiate myself. And I had this sense that there was this, uh, this untapped uh, talent pool of people who just needed to know the way that things worked in the business um, and just needed a set of information in order to find their way. And people in the, in the industry thought I was crazy to be doing it. I mean, people were like, why would you want to do that? Why would you open the floodgates? Um, but I, I knew that I needed to build a personal connection with, with authors so that if people could get a sense of who I was and my integrity and, um, and just genuinely helping authors that it would give me a leg up and it ended up being true. Yeah. That's, that's a really interesting, uh, experience. It's sort of in a way it kind of maps on, I think, I think I'm sort of drawing these connections between like both sides actually of, of the equation can actually have similar experiences, but it seems to me crazy that people would think it was crazy of you to reach out to people that way and to, and to open the floodgates. I mean, aren't the floodgates, you know, things that should be opened when it comes to things like this. And in particular, um, I think that one thing that technology has opened up for self-published authors is actually interacting with readers. Um, something that I think a lot of authors 20 years ago would have thought, Oh my God, why would I open up those floodgates? Right. Uh, but has, so in your, in your experience, and I want to ask you about Jacob, the Jacob Wonderbar trilogy, um, has interacting with readers been something, not just of your blog, but readers of your novels, been something that you've engaged in actively online? Oh, definitely, and it's 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 wonderfully gratifying to hear from 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 readers uh, directly, um, and and to be able to, I mean, j- even just being able to reciprocate. I mean, I remember when I was a child writing to my favorite authors and never hearing back from them, but the idea that you can. Um, email or, or tweet at one of, some of your favorite writers and get a response is like it's a wonderful world to, that we live in, um, and and so yeah, it's it's one of the it's one of the best parts of the gig. Uh, and so, uh, when did you um, start start writing novels yourself? So I, it wasn't until I was in my late twenties. I I, um, I wrote a screenplay and then I wrote a novel that was based on that screenplay. Um, and I received some positive feedback from some agents and in one agent in particular who, um, sent me a very encouraging, um, rejection letter or actually a request for revision that, um, that detailed all the ways that he thought that the, the novel could be improved. Um, and I, I saw that, that letter and I was like, you know what, he's right. And I just don't think I can do this. I don't think that, I don't think that, um, I have it in me to, 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 to really nail this, this revision. Uh, and around that time I had this idea of this kid who was trapped on a planet full of substitute teachers. Um, and so I put that other novel in the drawer, which is enormously painful, um, wrote this novel in secret. I mean, I wrote a whole middle grade novel with, with um, the only a handful of people in my life even knew about it. My own family didn't even know about it. Um, and then I, and why did you just, sorry to interrupt, but why did you, why did you make that decision to write in stealth mode like that? Um, I think I was just, I, I thought I was being crazy for doing it and I just, um, couldn't bear anyone asking me about it or, um, or being disappointed for me if it didn't work out. I just, uh, I don't know. In retrospect, I, I think I was acting pretty irrationally and that, and now I'm much more open about my creative process, but it was, I was just scared and just didn't know, know what was going to happen. And, uh, I just written a whole novel and it kind of, from my perspective at the time, kind of crashed and burned, even though in retrospect, I don't feel that way. It just, it's just so intense writing a novel and putting yourself out there. And, um, I just kind of psyched myself out about the whole thing. And so you had this, uh, inspiration for, uh, a story about, um, a kid from, from the planet where substitute teachers come from. If I, if I've got it, yes, no, that's, that's just he's, such a cool idea. He's from earth, but then he ends up and he's sort of the, um, the, uh, a tormentor of substitute teachers, but then he, he somehow stumbles upon the, uh, the planet where substitute teachers come from. 
uh, and yeah, so I use that as the as the basis to um, to flush out uh, a whole series of, of three kids who blast off into space and have to find their way back home and have lots of wacky adventures uh, along the way. And what was your experience like uh, pitching the idea to publishers? It was it was a, a pretty fascinating process. So I was a literary agent at the time. It was at the time that my blog was kind of at its peak popularity, and so I thought. I don't know what I expected going in, but what ended up happening is I sent query letters to the people I knew in the business, the people I knew who represented um, science fiction for children, and uh, everyone rejected me. Everyone I knew rejected me um, or, or rejected my novel. I mean, look, even I'm a literary agent, I know better, and I just did it where it's like they rejected me. No, I mean, they rejected my, they passed on my novel. Um, and, uh, and that's another thing that I thought going in was that I was a literary agent. I worked with authors every day. I sent manuscripts out. I thought I was going to be totally cool through the process. And it turns out that I was just like any other author going through the process. Um, and But eventually I um, I sent a query letter to uh, Catherine Drayton at Inkwell. And, and Catherine's a wonderful agent who represents The Book Thief um, by Marcus Zusak, among many others. Um, and, uh, she liked it, took it on and then, um, sent it out. And again, I thought I was going to be totally cool. And I was crumbling by the end of the first month of, on submission, but, um, eventually uh, a couple of publishers offered and I ended up going with Penguin and, um, the rest kind of wrote itself. And, um, you know, now I look back and when I tell the story and, or people sort of get to know me later on, they sort of like, well, I mean, of course you wrote these books and of course they were published, but it was a really scary journey, even as someone who was living and breathing book publishing from the inside. Um, it, I, it was, it was not a given. I mean, it helped that I knew people in the business, but none of those people wanted to represent me. So it was kind of an interesting process. Uh, speaking of your journey, um, eventually, uh, so there you, there you were, you were a literary agent and you were a published author and you, you moved on in your career, uh, yeah. to something else. What, uh, what sort of motivated that shift? It was, it was a really interesting time for me. Um, just professionally, I, I, I really liked working with authors. I enjoyed working, um, in the world of, of, of books. Um, but it was a couple of different things. I think the, the biggest, the biggest thing was just, I had this drive to just try something new and to try to, to, um, to diversify. And I'm, um, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the podcast, I'm just really fascinated by technology and I really enjoyed the process of building up an online community and having that, um, that community around me. It was, it was really amazing. Um, and so, uh, around that time I was thinking, maybe I want to try something new that's, that's not in, in book publishing. Um, a, uh, an opportunity came along to be CNET's first social media manager. And I, I love CNET, um, I, I, as a brand is something, you know, I've, I've been following them for, for years and it just seemed like such an amazing opportunity to take what I learned building up my own, my own online community for a company that I really loved. Um, and so I, I made the leap. It was really, um, it was really wrenching leaving my clients. I mean, it was, um, it was honestly like going through, um, you know, 30 breakups, uh, in one day. Um, and, uh, it was, it was really hard and, but, um, I left them all in good hands and many of them gone on to have like very successful writing careers. Uh, and I'm still in touch with, with I'm friends with a lot of them. And I'm so thankful that I, I made that shift. I've just learned so much uh, working in different careers and, and industries. And I feel like I've grown so much as a person. And I've still maintained that connection to the book world, uh, which has been uh, really, really gratifying. Uh, as I understand it, you, you moved on from CNET, and it may, may, may not have been the exact next move, but you also worked for a hedge fund for a while. I did. Um, which is... Which is uh, Interesting in itself, uh, but also interesting because, you know, I think a lot of people in the publishing industry are, understand that, and particularly self-published authors, that building an online brand, building an online presence is important for you. We understand that it's important for different types of companies, particularly tech companies. Uh, but uh, what was it like doing that kind of work for a hedge fund? 
It was really fascinating. I mean, it, I, it, it's really going from the book publishing industry where so much is, is subjective and so much is, 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 um, um, you know, uh, artistic and, and, you know, ephemeral going to a place that placed a huge amount of emphasis on rigor and logic and, um, and, um, and that, like rigorous, very rigorous analysis. Um, and also going from, you know, book publishing, which really prizes a work life balance for the most part, people work very hard in publishing, but it's a kind of a, it's a, um, kind of slower paced environment by nature to a very, very hyper competitive, intense place. Uh, it was really, really fascinating. And I'm, I'm so thankful I had that experience. I mean, I learned so much just being inside those walls and seeing the way that, um, that people think. And, um, you know, the, the hedge fund I worked for, uh, Bridgewater Associates is, uh, is the world's largest hedge fund. The, the founder is, has been, um, in the last couple of years, especially really sharing his, his knowledge with the world in the form of, um, his principles book and, um, and videos and all these other things. And it, it's, it was just a really tremendous education and one that I think ultimately benefited me a lot, both in terms of, um, um, giving me a new way of thinking about the world, benefiting artistically, just being exposed to, um, such an innovative and such a cutting edge place. I mean, um, and, um, yeah, it was a really, it was a really fascinating experience. Uh, a lot of what you're saying really resonates with me. Uh, I moved on from a doctorate in English literature to investment banking. Um, oh. uh, I did uh, M and a in London for two and a half years. Um, and I appreciate what you're saying about the different lifestyle and different pace and the different competitiveness. And, and particularly I appreciate, I mean, I, I had the very same experience of being so excited by that, by that environment. At the same time, I do remember skepticism about an English major being in those in that in that environment. I, I worked for a company that actually had a pretty diverse pool that it drew from, more diverse than I think a lot of people think happens in finance. Um, did you encounter any skepticism from people that moving from, say, something like the book publishing industry in, into an environment like that, even though you'd already had experience, you know, building online communities and stuff like that, so people would have known about your tech? work as well not, not too much and i think that that's one of the wonderful things about um about bridgewater is they very much appreciate having um an interesting background and an unconventional background uh and sort of being the individual that you are um and um that you know it's interesting one of the one of the, the main commonalities um, between book publishing and, and, and Bridgewater was just that both of those environments really put a premium on people just being themselves and sort of being their, their authentic selves. Um, and, um, and, it, and it's sort of, you know, if that comes with some eccentricity, then that's, then that's welcomed. Um, and so, no, I was, I felt, I felt fortunate that, that, that my background was, wasn't a hindrance or something I had to hide. It was, I mean, um, it was, Bridgewater also believes strongly in transparency. And so I was very open about the fact that I was an author and that I ultimately wanted to be writing books and, um, and everyone was very supportive of that. And, uh, you, as I understand, you've, uh, you've been working with Uber for about a year and a half or something like that. Uh, can yep. you talk a little, I mean, this is, you know, one of the, uh, companies that at least is always on the, on the sort of top of my headline sort of list of headlines to read about things because I'm particularly interested in self-driving cars and things like that. Uh, what, what, what sort of work are you doing for Uber? Um, I'm doing, I'm working with their, their tech brand team on, um, audience development. And so, um, one of the interesting things that have happened over the last 10 years is, um, is the, the use of blogs, um, has gone from something you'd be crazy to do to something that can be a really effective tool uh, for for companies to reach uh, their not either potential customers or potential recruits, and so Uber has a wildly innovative blog for for Silicon Valley, and have been very very effective at creating um, a, a, just a really great blog that showcases their engineering work to uh, to potential talent who might want to work in a tech organization, 
And so, yeah, so I've been, I've been working with them for about a year and a half on, on strategy and, um, and, uh, how, how to grow their audience and, um, audience development and things like that. And it's been a lot of fun. And so it's, it's building, it's, it's building an audience through the provision of interesting content, uh, written, right. co- written content for a particular audience, which is potential recruits for, for Uber. Exactly. And also the broader world, just, you know, the, it, there's a reason that, that people think of Uber not just as the company that um, that gets you from point A to point B, but I, I think that there's an appreciation of the technology that they that they utilize in order to make all of that happen, and that perception is in part driven by the fact that they have this this blog. They've been very transparent about showing different pieces of their technology to the outside world, and so we don't just think of Uber as that app. It's it's wow, that's some incredible technology that's making all of this happen. Shifting gears a little bit, I'd like to talk to you about book publish the book publishing industry generally, particularly in the U.S. Um, and so this is going to be a little bit of a long setup uh, to this question. But um, while preparing for this interview, I listened to an interview you did on something I think called the Aspiring Writer Podcast back in 2017. And in the interview, you mentioned something that really uh, struck me, um, that you found your reading habits had shifted to current events over fiction reading. Um, and what really resonated with me was right at that moment when I heard you saying that I it recalled to me an experience I had around 2017 myself when I decided to finally sit down and read John Rawls theory of justice uh and after reading just a couple of long sentences which I normally love doing and staring down the barrel of hundreds more pages of the same elaborate kind of theorizing which I normally also love I thought to myself how useless it all seemed in the current political moment um and it seems something might be happening more broadly in American book publishing and reading culture where nonfiction uh, about current and historical events uh, has seen increasing sales. And I think, I think fiction sales are down. So, well, I'd like to ask you the more generally from the broader perspective, you know, are, are there times when it's irresponsible to read fiction uh, and, and then perhaps sort of narrowing that down and drawing a connection to the book publishing industry? Do you think that, that, you know, political changes in the United States in the last few years have been driving people's reading habits? Um, on the first question, I mean, it's never irresponsible to be reading fiction. And if anything, we need, we need more people to read more fiction. I mean, uh, both anecdotally, just, um, you know, it's, 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 it deepens your experience of life and, uh, you, and you can gain so much insight and meaning from reading. But there are also, I mean, scientific studies that show that people who read more novels are, uh, are more, tend to be more empathetic um, as human beings. So particularly at a, at a moment in time when the world is lacking in, in empathy, and in particular for empathy for um, uh, more disempowered groups, uh, we need fiction now more than than ever. Um, but that said, I do I absolutely think that um, that current events are really driving and shaping reading habits, and you can see it in the bestseller list, and you can see the the, the amount of um, energy behind um, books that have anything to do with with the political situation um, in this country. At the same time, that I, I also personally feel like this, and I don't have I don't have the, the data or the um, at, at my fingertips to, to back this up, but um, uh, you know, there's there's just so much competition for attention, and um, and social media and apps are so shaping not just the way that we consume our time, but the way our brains work and our, our capacity to to focus for long periods and our attention span. Um, that I, I, I've really worried about, um, about books as, as a platform, just be, just because I can feel my own attention span shrinking. Um, and I'm someone who reads still quite a bit, let alone people who don't read a book entirely. Um, but that said, I, I still see, I still see reason for optimism. I mean, a lot more people are listening to audiobooks, and, and so like, that's another way of consuming content. And, uh, and I also have, this is also anecdotal, but I've seen it, at, um, elsewhere. Um, I've carved out more time for reading just because, um, because of the effect that social media and the apps are, are having on me and, uh, and carving out my ability to concentrate and to, to block out distractions. And I think we'll continue to see that 
more and more. I've, I've always been, it, because of my love of technology, I've always been very pro ebook and be excited about the innovations that it offers. I still read primarily ebooks, but at the same time, you can just see print holding on as a, as a platform. Um, and you know, I think a lot of that has to do with, um, with blocking out, um, the, the internet. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you a question about, you've been doing an annual eBooks survey for the past 12 years or so. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you've seen, I mean, in addition to how people's use appears to have been changing, have you seen changes in attitudes towards eBooks? Yeah, it was. It was really it, that that poll has been has been fascinating to me over the years. Uh, the first time I I um, I, um, I published the poll was I, I'm almost positive it was before the Kindle, and so ebooks were like really hypothetical that people were talking about um, at that time. There wasn't even really a device to read them very well. I believe the Sony Reader was out at the time. I first launched the poll, but the Kindle wasn't out, the iPad wasn't out. Um, and, um, and I, but I still felt, felt like it was inevitable for the future because I, I because of, of costs and I, I just, you know, mass market, um, took off because it was cheaper and, and the potential for eBooks to be cheaper still, uh, made me feel like eventually it was going to become ubiquitous. Um, then the, then the Kindle came along and, they, and you started – people kind of got it a little bit more. But the Kindle, the original Kindle uh, – I'm sorry, uh, Jeff Bezos was a little bit clunky and just kind of um, uh, not a device that really made people super excited. But the, you still started – the hardcore readers started shifting. And then around that time, I, um, I published a blog post that was like, I don't think the ebooks are really going to take off until there is a larger iPhone of the future. <laughs> and then, then when, so uh, it turns out that was one of, one of, I don't know how many of my predictions were right, but that was a, a correct one where there was another shift in perception once the iPad came out and it gave people another avenue, um, to, to read eBooks who didn't like e-ink. Um, but then after this anew, initial burst of enthusiasm in this wave, Things kind of leveled off. The growth, the, the exponential growth became incremental growth. Um, and uh, there hasn't been since the iPad a real serious innovation in, in, the, in the, the medium, um, in the way giving people different or new opportunities to, to read ebooks. And I think around that time, uh, you also saw the, the burst in, in social media, and then I think more and more people beginning to, to hold on to paper books as an antidote to, to screens. Um, and so right now, it's 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 been a little bit of a um, of a tapering off, but I still think that, that in the long term, um, it's it's still I think the future, both from a, I mean from an environmental perspective, from um, from a cost perspective, uh, I. I think it's through the future. Still, I still do. It's it's really interesting. I want to ask you a specific question about uh, what it was like seeing um, eBooks and and specifically the Kindle and things like the iPhone come out from the agent's perspective. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to take the opportunity to make an observation. One of the things I've found just anecdotally in my experience talking to people interested in books in the publishing world is that people who either in fact or in them, their imagination have a sort of sympathy for the experience of being deprived of access to books, uh, tend to just naturally see the value of eBooks much more passionately, I suppose, or positively or more, more, it's a good predictor. Let's just put it that way for someone's attitude towards, towards eBooks versus print books. If they've, if they've had this experience of feeling deprived at some point in their lives. I, I totally agree with you, and um, a lot, a lot of um, of the skepticism of eBooks that I encountered on, on, on my blog or in, in the industry, or in, in just talking with people, were people who felt so deeply sentimental about bookstores and about their their neighborhood bookstore that they grew up with and things like that. But I didn't have that growing up. I mean, I I, I, I grew up in a, in a town without a bookstore. And, um, the, the nearest, um, bookstore to me was 30 miles away. And it was a, a tiny mall B Dalton that was, did not, and no one is feeling nostalgic about that, that bookstore. Um, and, and so the, when Amazon came along, 
Um, and then when eBooks came along, I, I, I approached it exactly as you say from that from that from that that sense of book scarcity and just imagining myself as a child having access to Amazon. Oh my God. I mean, or being able to just download a book when I wanted one, instead of having to wait until my parents went to Sacramento, you know, next month. It's just, uh, it's, it's, um, I think that, that people who didn't grow up in, in, in a big city or suburbia, I think have a real sense of appreciation for the access yeah, there's there's a really interesting you, you bring up bookstores and this, let's say sort of I'll, I'll call it nostalgia for bookstores, uh, but it's it's something that always strikes me as well because there's another there's another side to things where um, privacy becomes a really important issue. Um, I remember interviewing someone for this podcast who talked about growing up in a community in Eastern Europe where you know if you went to the local bookstore and asked for a book on divorce, you might get a, a visit from the local priest. Um, and I like, I like to tell that story because it reminds me of a, a, a letter that I think was published by a group of uh, independent bookshop owners in Chicago talk, complaining about Amazon's algorithm and saying, nobody knows you better than we do because we know you personally. Do you think that, well, I guess I just asked, what do you, when, you, you would have seen you know, Amazon grow uh, throughout your career as this online place that sort of can can target you, but without knowing you. Do you think that there's something that people should be concerned about when it comes to being targeted on Amazon? I mean, can you end up in a in a bubble, or is is this actually like an opportunity for people to experience more freedom in a sense? That's a that's a good question. I mean, I, I should probably state my biases up up front, which is I tend to be pretty sanguine about potential privacy issues. Um, I, I don't, I'm not, um, very, I don't tend to be super worried about, about privacy. I mean, when, in some of the early ebook debates, I remember having these back and forth with, with readers where they're like, when something's electronic and you can just be wiped from your, um, wiped from your, your device and all these other things. And, and my standpoint was always, if they're wiping books from our electronic devices, we have way bigger problems than what's happening with the books. I mean, because the, whatever society that we're living in at that state is is so terrible that like that we're probably not going to be as too worried about our books. We're going to be like fighting in the streets. Um, so, I from a, from a privacy perspective, I mean, I'm I'm always surprised at how these things end up becoming um, catastrophes that I hadn't envisioned. Um, um, and so I'm probably not the best equipped to anticipate uh, potential privacy issues that could arise from from the, the, the books themselves. Um, I, I tend to just be more excited about the opportunity and, and trusting that the marketplace will, on the whole, uh, figure figure out the, the broader issues. Yeah, and, and circling back, that actually uh, is a good segue. Circling back into uh, the perception of opportunity and the rise of ebooks. So there you were, a literary agent, you know, sort of representing authors and I think estates as well. Um, did you, did you represent Winston Churchill's estate for a time? I, I did in, in the United States. Yeah. He had a primary agent in, in the UK. And so I, I represented the, book, um, the books in the United States. And so how, how did people from these various perspectives uh, react when eBooks started coming out? I mean, for, for you as an agent, was it like, wow, what a new opportunity to make more money for my clients? Um, it's, it, it's interesting. So as, as, um, when ebooks came along, it felt like to the consumer they kind of came out of nowhere. But in the industry, they'd been discussed for a very, very long time, and they there had been discussions around them for a very, very long time. Um, but there, there were definitely a lot of um, a lot of um, battles and sort of back and forth between agents and publishers about how these books should be treated, um, and you know how much of the holistic cost of creating a book should be taken into account. How much should the fact that publishers aren't paying for um, for paper and distribution be taken into account? And then, so there was there was a very very long standing debate over um, the right um, split between um, publishers and uh, and authors uh, that were being negotiated by agents, and then as well about the, the business model that the, the publishers should, um, uh, work out with the ebook distributors, which of course led to the whole fight between the, the, um, the wholesale or the, um, or the agency model. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, those debates raged for a long time, but agents were, were definitely all over it. On the subject of, 
what authors earn uh, and what publishers earn. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was uh, for people who follow the book publishing industry blogs and media, uh, one of the sort of things that you constantly see contradictory signals about, at least in my experience, is author earnings. Yeah. Um, and typically, I mean, it's already happened in 2019 with the Authors Guild. You know, some organization releases what's more or less seems like kind of sketchy data highlighting how low author earnings are and what a disaster we're facing. Uh, but at the same time, it appears that things have never been better for self-published authors and things look really po positive on that horizon. Uh, what, what are your views on this issue about how, you know, author earnings are faring generally in the United States? It's, it's tough. I mean, I, I think what you've seen in, in, Traditional publishing is the hollowing out of the of the middle. The, you know, there used there used to be much more of a, a robust mid list where um, um, you know advances and ranging between you know fifty thousand to one hundred fifty thousand that would afford um, an author with maybe a few other gigs on the side to really be make to carve out a space um, writing nonfiction, especially, but. As with everything else in, 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 in the economy, it's just been things have consolidated between, um, you know, a few, like a handful and a, and a smaller group of big winners and, and the bigger the bigs are bigger than ever. Um, and then everyone else kind of like scrambling for the long tail and um, and 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 kind of scrapping by and. I think that trend is just has, has continued. There are definitely authors who have carved out um, very successful places for themselves, self-publishing. But to this point, at the risk of overgeneralizing, they tend to be genre authors. They tend to be authors who are just cranking out books and are really able to satisfy um, a, a base of readers who are very hungry to be reading different books by the same author or in the same series. And so the landscape for authors who are writing books that take more time to write, um, who maybe are writing something that's more literary or artistic, um, and, then, and then trying to generate attention and, and, the, and the credibility for those types of works, it's very difficult for that author, and it's certainly really difficult for that author to, um, to make any, any, literally any money doing that. Um, and so... It's a tough. It's it's it's. I on the whole, I, I still maintain that it's never. There's never been a better time to be an author because every book can at least sort of find its place and find its audience. But the demands placed on authors in order to even bring that about are greater and greater. Whether whether you go traditional publishing or self publishing, it just takes an enormous amount of work to promote the book. To to uh, on top of writing the book. Um, to be to have all these skill sets that aren't you know, always compatible between marketing and writing and being creative and being organized and being a product manager and all of these different um, skill sets coming together and um, I, I still think that we're in a little bit of a wild west where the traditional publishing is very a very well oiled machine but but maybe you know um, um, uh, consolidating, and then um, you have kind of like the self-publishing world, which is new, but the, it hasn't quite organized itself in a way that necessarily works for authors. But I think you'll begin to see that kind of taking shape in a more constructive way in the next five to ten years. Yeah, that's really interesting. You say that. My next question was actually going to be about about organizing. Um, the Authors Guild in the United States uh, is currently suggesting that authors should try, and particularly, presumably, self-published authors should should try to band together to engage in collective negotiations with companies like Amazon, Google, and Facebook. Do you see, I mean, and, and sort of, sort of just to sort of like flesh that issue out a little bit, uh, you mentioned, you know, genre authors who are really cranking the books out can actually make, can, can make a fair amount of money. One of the reasons they need to keep cranking books out is very specific that like Amazon's algorithms look at how, how often you're publishing new books. And so if you don't publish one, I think it's currently every 30 days, then, you know, you sort of dramatically can fall off um, their, their sort of promotional algorithm. And so do you think that this is something that authors can actually succeed at banding together on, uh, sort of uh, presenting themselves as a single interest group to companies like Amazon and Google and Facebook and try to put pressure on them to make a more, let's say, favorable environment, one in which, for example, the algorithm can't just be changed uh, on you overnight and you can have, you know, your successful book business, you know, completely torn out from underneath you. 
It's an interesting question, and um, it's one that I don't feel like I totally know the answer to. I mean, I do, I do welcome uh, authors coming together uh, to advance their interests, and I think that's a that's a it's a great pursuit. Um, the challenge is 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 trying to unify in all of the di- different interests across authors, who many of which have different goals, many of which have, are writing very different types of books. And inevitably, you tweak an algorithm, you're creating winners and losers. And so banding authors together for a, for a singular vision of what that algorithm should be is something I, I'm a little bit skeptical of. I mean, I'm sure everyone can agree that we would want more like of the share of the revenue. I, I mean, that's maybe one thing that everyone can agree upon. But um, um, I, I tend to think that this is going to be sorted out by the marketplace and where there's, um, um, you know, where authors, uh, or where readers are, who is serving readers best, I think will, will be the, the, the place that ultimately ends up prevailing. Um, at the same time, um, you know, we're, we're Amazon's consolidation of the market has, has been almost complete when it comes to eBooks. And I, I, I worry about the lack of, um, of innovation, uh, and competition to create alternatives and, and alternative ways of um, forms of discovery uh, and things like that. So I, it's tough. It's tough. It's a tough landscape. And I, I, I wish I had uh, more of the answers. I've got two, two final questions to ask you. The first is about uh, Barnes and Noble and the second is about your current novel that you're working on. Um, so it's become a bit of a a kind of theme of this podcast for me to ask people what they think is going to happen at Barnes and Noble in the near term and what impact they think a collapse of Barnes and Noble would have have on uh, the book publishing industry in the U S definitely. Um, about a year ago I published, uh, um, I had a conversation with, um, uh, Mike Shatskin, who's a, a long time publishing consultant and has, he also has a really incredible blog on, um, on this sort of inside of, of book publishing and of some of the marketing, and we, uh, um, and we talked a lot about um, about this very topic: what would happen um, if if Barnes and Noble um, were to go bankrupt? Which, to be clear, is not imminent by anything I've I've seen, but it's 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 a definitely a perennial uh, topic of conversation and. Um, where we arrived is that it would have a really very significant impact on on um, on the publishing industry. Um, if you think about what publishers are, they're really a, a, a collection of services that um, take a book and, and and make it happen. In order for that to happen, there's editing, there's putting together the, the design and the physical um, um, the physical book. But the thing that they offer that's the true competitive advantage that can't be recreated by an author is their distribution. And uh, they are the ones who can get a book into a bookstore. They, uh, they know how to do that. They have the relationships. They have the infrastructure. Um, they have the processes. And so uh, in a time when, uh, when print is still the, the lion's share of an author's revenue, authors – uh, still need to go to publishers in order to to reach the bulk of their readers. If Barnes and Noble were to um, go bankrupt and close their stores, and there there wasn't um, um, a um, anything that jumped in to to replace them, it would be a very significant challenge for publishers to maintain costly uh, the costly infrastructure for that that facilitates the distribution. Um, and, um, and, and kind of maintain their value prop and, and maintain, um, their, their appeal to authors. Uh, it would, um, it would probably would prompt another wave of consolidation. Um, um, and it, it, it would really also, one of, one of the things that it would also impact is, um, the ability of publishers to make a big splash with a new book, um, um, when you, you know, when, when they're able to go to Barnes and Noble and, and make a make a splash across the country, but um, independent books bookstores tend not to be as consolidated and have more individualized interests. And so, being able to break out a title through marketing within bookstores it would be more challenging. Um, so it would be it would be a big deal. It'd be a really big deal, and it could um, um, push things more towards eBooks potentially. 
it could push more toward um, authors going it alone hmm. um, because if, if it's not that hard to make a book. Um, you know, for an author, as anyone who's self-published knows, the hard part is not, um, it's not the making of the book. The hard part is the marketing and the distribution. And if that distribution goes away, um, it's, you know, an author, even a, a very big author could look at the landscape and might say, you know what, I'm going to take the bulk of the revenue by doing this myself. And, um, and I'm going to go it alone. It's it's such an interesting industry arc. I mean, uh, you know, probably let's say thirty years ago, the rise of the big box stores would have been seen by book lovers generally, and and ind independent bookstore lovers who are a distinct group uh, would have seen the rise of those big stores as a huge existential threat. Uh, and and now when we we hear about you know the big the big chains closing, we're like another existential threat. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, do you think so? Do you, so I guess what you and, and I should say, I, I actually interviewed Mike for this podcast a little while ago. Oh, great. Uh, Mike Shatskin as well. And I, I think I asked him the same question about Barnes and yeah. Noble. I mean, he uh, probably had a much better answer than I did because he's a real expert on that one. No, no, that was, that was a very good answer. But, um, so are, are you, are you, uh, suggesting that it would actually be bad overall, even for independent bookstores, if, you know, a big chain like that collapsed? Um, I don't think, I don't know. I don't know that it would necessarily be, I mean, it would be, it'd be bad for, for, I mean, all the wonderful people who work at Barnes and Noble would be bad for people in the publishing industry. Um, it would be more, it would shift the landscape. And so again, there would be, there'd be winners and losers from that, um, from that shift. Um, for authors, I, I, I don't know. I think at the end of the day, um, authors are able to find their, their, their readership and, um, um, whether whether you're an author who's, who's self-publishing a passion project or whether you're J.K. Rowling or James Patterson, you're going to find your audience. And um, and so I, I tend to be more optimistic from the standpoint of the author because um, before, if a publisher didn't find your work commercially viable, it went into a drawer and no one could see it. But now, you know, even if the, even if your readership is is a dozen people, if it's a hundred people, if it's a thousand people, it's it's great that you're able to try it and get it out there and, and have it find the readership that, that it's going to find. And so, um, if Barnes and Noble were to, um, to go under, certainly that would create a, a more challenging environment for certain types of authors. And it would be very, um, very difficult for the publishing industry. And it could, yeah, it could even be hard for the indie bookstores if, if, um, publisher's distribution becomes unwieldy and they have to sort of cut back on even their, their print distribution. And so, um, and yeah, it's, um, it would be an, uh, it'd be a huge, huge shock to the system, but books are going to be books and they're going to still be there. Um, well, we've got just a couple of minutes left, my, left. My last question is, uh, can you talk a little bit about your latest novel that you're working on? Yeah, so um, so to take to, to take things full circle, I, I, the first thing I wrote um, when I was uh, after college was um, that screenplay and that that novel that I sent around to um, um, to agents the first time around, and I, I I I took that essential idea and turned it into a young adult novel uh, before it was intended for adults. But this is a young adult novel that I've been working on for a very long time. It's a really challenging premise. Um, and one that I've really struggled with figuring out how to make it work, but I'm hopeful I finally found a way to make it work. I just finished the, uh, the first draft right before the holidays, currently in the process of, um, of re revising and then, um, hopefully, hope, uh, hopefully we'll send it to my agent, um, in the next couple months. So, um, fingers crossed. Uh, yeah. So it's it, my first series was middle grade. This is young adult. So it's a different vibe and a different, um, approach uh, but i'm uh cautiously hopeful and excited about it and i'm telling you about it uh which means that i'm not like i used to be where i'm keeping everything a total secret so uh, well, well thanks thanks for that sharing that and thanks uh for taking the time to do this interview i really appreciate it uh, congratulations on finishing the first draft of your novel best best wishes for the next couple of months as you get things firmed up uh and yeah uh, thanks again for taking the time to do this interview thank you this was great thanks